This is Peter Kendall for The Socionomist. A grand supercycle strut down the catwalk, from bear market to just plain bear. Among social trends, none is more visual than fashion styles. Fashion appears to be in constant motion, with changes that are so rapid they can make your head spin. The question is, where do you look in order to follow fashion trends? Not there, although that is nice. No, 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 not there. This isn't that kind of video. Yes, there. Not the legs themselves, but literally how much leg you see. And yes, we are talking about Wall Street's renowned hemline indicator, which observes that hemlines rise and fall with the stock market. University of Pennsylvania economist George Taylor first made the connection between hemlines and stocks in 1926, and market analyst Ralph Rottenham helped to popularize the relationship in the 1960s. Bob Prechter evoked this indicator as far back as 1985 and showed a wealth of evidence about its psychological importance. He wrote, In my judgment, it is not unreasonable to hypothesize that a rise in both hemlines and stock prices reflects a general increase in friskiness and daring among the population, and a decline in both a decrease. Because skirt lengths have limits, the floor and the upper thigh respectively, the reaching of a limit would imply that a maximum of positive or negative mood had been achieved. So when we happened upon the Fashion Institute of Technology's Trendology exhibit during a recent trip to New York, of course we had to go in. The exhibit was billed as a study of fashion trends and their relationship to the culture. What we found inside led us to conclude that the basic relationship between fashion, culture, and social mood as reflected in the stock market, has held for at least the past 120 years. In a video that accompanied the exhibit, fashion experts addressed the idea of trends. In doing so, several of them captured the role of social mood quite well. Connie Wang, style director of Refinery29, noted, for instance, that in a completely rational world, there would be no hurting and thus no trends. Trend is an interesting word because in some senses it shouldn't exist if if designers have access unlimited access to all the resources and touch points and you know things out there like the fact that multiple ones will do the same thing um, in one season is kind of mind-boggling right um, but I think about trends in that not, not not the micro trends that happen from season to season but if you look look at trends across a decade it's just a complete manifestation of like what's happening socially, what's happening politically, what's happening, you know, in pop culture. It's, um, you can literally see it manifest itself through clothes. Trend is a term that actually is a scientific term. It's used either in the financial world or in the fashion world, and it's something that points out a direction. It's something that tells you in which direction a term, a concept, an item is going, either going up, either going down. Are we talking about stock going up, going down? Are we talking about motorcycle jackets going up, going down uh, in the popularity of the market? Something like hippie was very, very much tied in to the culture in the broadest, broadest sense, as was punk, because England was going through this dire economic period. People had to make clothes out of trash bags. They were angry, safety pins. It meant something. The curators began the exhibit in the late 1700s, near the beginning of a multi-century bull market. As the United States was born and the prior major negative social mood trend was ending, skirts were basically on the floor. This is evident in the earliest fashion item in the exhibit. The social mood trend manifested slowly in fashion during the early stages of the grand supercycle bull market. For the bull market's first 100 years, hemlines more or less stayed on the floor. But in about 1895, as stocks began to approach an interim peak, ankle-length skirts appeared. The exhibit's creators note that fashion inhabits the culture, and at the turn of the 20th century, the positively trending social mood produced an interesting interaction between fashion and another bull market manifestation. Skyscrapers represent the expansion of aspiration and ambition, which invariably reach new heights at positive mood extremes. Rising hemlines express a greater level of friskiness within society, another reflection of a positively trending mood. In the early 1900s, 
these two trends actually came together to create a popular sensation, the Flatiron Building, which opened in 1902 on the back of the same positive mood trend that carried hemlines higher. The building created a serious downdraft at the intersection of Broadway, 5th Avenue, and 23rd Street. Here's how the book The City in Slang, New York Life, and Popular Speech describes the scene. The street corner at the prow of the Flatiron Building was famous as the city's best spot for girl watching. The famous flat iron breezes sometimes blew up women's long skirts to the delight of male gawkers. Cartoons, postcards, photographs, and humor about the spectacle of exposed ankles and knees made the corner famous, even in Europe. The phenomenon was memorialized in a risque flicker called the flat iron building on a windy day. The movie came out in 1905 a year before the stock market made a multi-year high. After that peak, the inflation-adjusted Dow failed to make any new headway for another 16 years, during which time skirt lengths remained relatively steady. It took the positive mood behind the roaring bull market of the 1920s to finally elevate skirts to women's knees. These designs are from McCall's 1929 dress patterns. Here again, the revealing new style inhabited the culture. The flappers became the rage. In addition to their ankles and calves, flappers put their bare arms on display. As historian Kenneth A. Yellis put it, the flapper was an extreme manifestation of changes in the lifestyles of American women made visible through dress. Journalist Kristen Conger explains that the style accommodated animated dance styles, such as the Charleston and the Foxtrot. Skirts went even higher in various pop culture outlets as social mood reached a major positive extreme in the late 1920s. By 1928, Hollywood was in on the act. Bare Knees, the story of a single flapper who causes a scandal in town with her bobbed hair and short skirts, came out in February 1928. By 1929, the flapper pick was a genre unto itself. Here's just a sampling of the flapper films that appeared as the stock market approached a peak in September 1929. This clip from the film Broadway Babies shows how revealing the flapper look became. The flapper look flamed out in the wake of the 1929 market crash as an intense negative mood trend pushed hemlines and stock prices lower. Skirts finally started their upside rebound in the early 1950s as positive mood waxed. This display of an evening dress from around 1950 and a silk number from 1954 show how skirts moved higher as the Dow Jones Industrials finally surpassed the high of 1929. The birth date of the miniskirt is open to debate, but the name is credited to designer Mary Quant, whose designs pushed hemlines several inches above the knee. Quant credits the look to everyday girls on the street. She took the name from her favorite car, the Austin Mini Cooper, in 1965. More shocking fashion displays appeared as the positive mood trend approached a peak in 1966. The euphoria continued through 1968, when the Dow returned to 1,000 and more speculative shares soared. The miniskirt gave way to the micro. This is McCall's sewing pattern circa 1968. As in the late 1920s, the short skirt was more than just a fashion. It was a social phenomenon. Short skirts again figured prominently in the plot lines of feature-length films. The positive mood trend in 1967-1968 was of a smaller degree than the one that peaked in 1929. And fittingly, the short skirt inspired cinematic offerings were fewer in number and lower in quality than their 1929 counterparts. 1967's Scorpions and Miniskirts is a good example of the B-movie fair. Another long-forgotten drama, Miniskirt Love, was billed as a shocking glimpse into the warped morals of the mod world. The Miniskirt Mob came out in May 1968 as the value line composite advanced to new record highs. The maxi appeared as the rebound in positive mood gave way to a negative social mood trend. This dress is from 1970. 
A positive trend began once again in 1974. The Dow was making new highs when society re-embraced short skirts in 1987, right before another stock market crash. Another mini skirt revival came as a stock market mania took the Dow to record heights in the 1990s. This black rayon dress is from Calvin Klein in 1996. For the first time since the 1960s, mini skirts became a standard look as mood headed toward a positive extreme in 2000. After that, it was anything but a one-way street, as this display, representing the years 2000 to 2013 in the Trendology exhibit illustrates. Skirts of varying lengths have battled for prominence over the course of the Great Peak, sometimes even within the same dress. The vacillating styles are reflections of a mixed social mood as society transitions from the positive mood of the grand supercycle bull market to a large degree bear market. This fragmentation in styles has not gone unnoticed in the garment district. In fact, the fickleness is so widespread that the exhibit's experts conclude by considering whether fashion trends themselves are a thing of the past. And social media, the internet, online shopping um, are part of this vast, confusing landscape of fashion. And if you try to understand it all and make sense of it, you really are going to lose your mind. I think everyone now in fashion is a little trend skeptical. Trends absolutely exist. I think what's happening now is they move so fast that they seem to not exist. They're moving so rapidly that they're kind of hard to pin down and talk about in any individual way. But through the lens of social mood, it is possible to pin them down. In fact, items like this camo maxi from the Trendology exhibit make perfect sense. It reveals that some designers were quick to spot the emerging negative mood trend. The Christian Dior design appeared in 2001, following the initial downturn in social mood. The negative mood trend reached its nadir in late 2002, and from there, mood began a positive trend that would eventually carry the stock market to new, nominal, all-time highs. The mini went out again as stocks approached their high in 2007. The victory was short-lived as a substantial negative trend in social mood unfolded the maxi surged to prominence in late 2008. The headlines on this chart showed how moments of long and short hemline dominance appeared coincident with the key highs and lows through 2009. What about the rally from 2009? Here again, the miniskirt trend ultimately coalesced, emerging as the reigning fashion champ as the Dow Jones Industrial surpassed 17,000 and then 18,000 in 2014. This mini, the only 2014 Trendology selection, marks the re-emergence of the frisky fashion trend. At 2014's spring fashion shows, the miniskirt dominated the catwalks. This headline, from the April 16, 2014 Wall Street Journal, caps off our chart of the Dow back through the beginning of the mania era. The article notes that styles went from shin-length confections in the wake of the stock market decline in 2011, to a surprise preference for shorter skirts in 2013, to the shortest in years at the spring fashion shows of 2014. And what of the style's larger role? As in 1929 and 1968, the mini has inhabited the culture at large. As the Dow moved past 17,000 through the spring, summer, and fall, the roster of celebrity mini skirt sightings got longer and longer. This photo essay is from InStyle.com on May 28, 2014. On November 21st, the New York Post's Page 6 section ran a piece highlighting an array of celebrities sporting ultra-short looks. It was titled, Where's the Rest of Your Dress? And it's not just celebrities. At this point, the style has clearly penetrated the mainstream. Here on Main Street in Gainesville, Georgia, for instance, the trend is quite evident. In fact, about one block from our offices, the miniskirt became a hot item this summer at the Dress Up Fashion Boutique. Here's the display that appeared out front in mid-July. And here's some more minis that the shop used to lure customers through the rest of the summer and fall. Even as temperatures plunged, stocks continued to advance into the new year, so skirts stayed high. This one is from January 8th, 
after the Dow crossed 18,000. In some ways, the miniskirt is bigger than ever. As the director of the Fashion Institute of Technology told the Daily News, today, the miniskirt can be worn by anyone. It used to be a very young person's style, but that concept has disappeared. The BBC cites a recent study by a British department store that found women today are happy to wear miniskirts up to the age of 40, whereas figures from 1980 showed that on average, women stopped buying minis when they reached their early 30s. Since the 1990s, minis have become more fashionable among plus-size women as well. For instance, the fashion website Polyvore offers more than 100 different styles of plus-size miniskirts. It may be tempting to agree with the Liverpool Echoes headline from 2014 that proclaimed the miniskirt will live on forever. A similar sentiment surfaced in the late 1960s. But the broad, seemingly permanent acceptance of the mini is actually another sign of an approaching extreme in trend. The Trendology exhibit quotes novelist Marie von Ebner Eschenbach, who said, as soon as fashion is universal, it is out of date. Another sign that the trend is reaching a turning point is that in some cases, the style is so revealing, it no longer covers anything at all. At the very top, it seems, absolutely nothing is left to the imagination. In 1968-1969, designer Yves Saint Laurent rang the bell with see-through dresses. In November 2013, a similar social extreme was established when a fashion commentator stated, stars are under a lot of pressure to show off their bodies. Expect to see plenty of celebrity skin. It's picking up. By June, pop star Rihanna showed up to receive the Fashion Icon Award in New York in this see-through dress. In October, designer Tom Ford took a page out of Saint Laurent's 1968 design book and clothed Rihanna and Miley Cyrus in an ultra-revealing style that was dubbed Viva Glam. And in November, Kim Kardashian made a big splash with this cover for Paper Magazine. But the latest bout of miniskirt mania diverges from its predecessors in the 1920s and 1960s in one important respect. It has yet to inspire any motion pictures, the closest it seems to have come is an adult film called Miniskirt Madness, which came out in 2000, and a 2013 short film by Stuart Weitzman, Made for Walking, which featured Kate Moss. The music in the film, These Boots Are Made for Walking, was actually a hit by Nancy Sinatra that went to number one in 1967, near the end of that decade's positive social mood trend. In many ways, the current version is an echo of that of the 1960s. On June 16th, there was even a free screening of 1968's Miniskirt Mob at the Social Club in Miami. Here's another cultural flashback to the 1960s that shows just how accepted the mini has become. On New Year's Eve, the Queen of England honored Mary Quan, now Dame Mary, as a pioneer of the miniskirt. There are other short-term signs that the fervor surrounding the latest miniskirt mania is losing steam. On August 10th, controversial clothing retailer American Apparel came under fire for an ad in its new back-to-school line. The ad featured a model bending over in a plaid miniskirt with her underwear visible. As noted, the trend appears to have reached its limit. As it does, the public's interest also appears to be waning. On August 11th, Time magazine labeled the scandal boring and said these ploys have gotten tiresome. There are other clues as well. Notice, for instance, that designer Tom Ford paired his barely there tops in his latest fashion statements with skirts that fall straight to the floor. Also, more recently, Kardashian covered her legs, or at least most of them. We think she could be on to the next big thing. Take a good look while you still can. The miniskirt's inability to generate the cultural excitement of prior eras is yet another signal of the cover-up to come. Here again, we expect something more extreme than the fashion and market trends of the 1970s and even the 1930s. Using 120 years of history as our guide, we expect hemlines to fall hard when social mood turns decisively negative. Thanks for watching. This is Peter Kendall for The Socionomist.